Welcome to the Financial Freedom Podcast, where we interview remarkable people and share strategies for mastering money and living a meaningful life. With your host, Grant Sabatier, creator of Millennial Money and author of Financial Freedom, a proven path to all the money you will ever need. Hey, everyone. I'm really excited today on the Financial Freedom Podcast to have a really good friend and deep thinker, Jillian from MontanaMoneyAdventures.com. So Jillian and I have been chatting for at least the past couple of years about what it means to be financially independent and what it means, more importantly, to live a meaningful life. And I've always enjoyed our conversations. We've never recorded them and really excited to have you on the podcast, Jillian. Thank you so much, Grant. It is awesome to be chatting with you, like always. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, how do you build a life that you don't want to retire from? I know in your coaching business and in your work, you really focus on, you know, helping others find deep motivations for living and constructing lives that they love, not just trying to get to a particular financial endpoint. Can you talk a little bit about what are some of those key strategies you can use to build a life that you don't want to retire from? Yeah, I think that this is such a confusing thing in in our day and age. You know, we kind of live under this assumption that work is horrible and it should make your life horrible and it should just be something that we escape from as soon as possible. But I think a lot of people, even in the FIRE movement, which I feel like I'm part of, but are realizing that once you hit that FI number, once you become financially independent, life keeps going. And there's there's not really like a prize at the end of this race. I view it more as now you get a custom build your life, which in reality looks like a huge pile of concrete and nails and sheetrock. And it's, a, it's actually a lot of work. It doesn't magically happen overnight as soon as you hit this spreadsheet number. It's something that we really have to be intentional about building. So what are some of those key strategies that people can intentionally, you know, say someone's listening to this and they feel stuck in their life, you know, they're, they're on the way to work, they're, you know, sitting at lunch, maybe they're listening to this because they're bored at work. What, what do you tell that person? How, how can they live with more intention in their lives? The first step is really thinking about what would, what would you want your life to look like? What would your ideal day be? When would you wake up? What would, what would the elements of it entail? What would that week look like? Or if you could kind of custom create a year, what does that look like? Is it, you know, four day weekends with friends? Is it visiting family? Is it some adventures? Do you tackle a few big projects? I think we have to have a really clear vision of what we what direction we want to go and what we want this thing to look like before we can start kind of taking steps in that direction. So there's kind of a visualization element of, okay, what, you know, if you woke up tomorrow and you had the perfect day, what would that look like? And then do you find that oftentimes when people do that, you know, I've realized that a lot of the things that at least make me happiest really require little money, if any at all, you know, things like Mm -hmm. walking my dog in the park or kayaking, or how can you analyze your kind of ideal day as a pathway to figuring out how much money you need? Yeah. So I have people go through, I come three focus questions on my site. They're actually up there for free. You just search mentoring questions. I have three mentoring questions that I have people go through. And one of them is that ideal day. One of them is our highlight reel. And the other is be, have, do. Who do you want to be? What do you want to have? And what do you want to do? And we compile the answers from all three of these lists. We see which ones pop up, you know, which items, which ideas pop up over and over. And then we can look at that and say, well, how much does this actually cost? Because oftentimes you're right. People are really surprised. They're like, oh, actually the things that would make my day amazing, like waking up and having breakfast with my spouse and going for a walk and doing a couple hours of like a really meaningful, engaging project, maybe going to exercise in the afternoon, having some friends over for dinner, like that actually doesn't cost that much. And oftentimes when we do that, we see ways 
that we could start doing those things now. Because one of the very disappointing things about early retirement is oftentimes people have this huge list of stuff that they want to do in early retirement. They're like, I'm going to work out, I'm going to run marathons, and like I'm going to meditate every day. And then they quit their job and they're like, oh, I still, uh, I still have a hard time doing these things. It's really hard to start living an entirely different life day one. It works so much better if you've slowly been cultivating these habits, cultivating these exercises before you hit that FI number. So one of the things I wanted to ask you, because I've thought a lot about this and I would just love your, your thoughts. We live in a world where we're told, go find your why or what's your why or what's your purpose or What's your passion or what makes you happy? Mm -hmm. What if you can't answer those questions? What if you've just been kind of focused on the daily grind and just trying to make ends meet and, you know, your whole life has been spent just, you know, trying to support yourself and maybe you don't know what your why is, you know, how how can you find your why? The first thing is we have have to honestly address burnout. Burnout is such a prevalent thing in our society and there's no no great workaround for it. I work with a lot of people who have tremendous amounts of burnout. I live in Montana, so I I think of it as like running through a forest trying to escape a bear. Like if you're running from <laughs> a bear, like that's the only thing you're thinking about. You're just focusing on surviving and your brain does not work creatively. Like you're not thinking, I wonder what amazing dish I should make for dinner tonight. Like you're just trying to not be dinner. So when you're in that kind of survival mode, all of the creativity of your brain just isn't going to work because it's just focusing on surviving. And you need to be able to take a step back. I mean, if people can only take a four-day weekend or a week off or a two-week vacation, come back to them after that. But it's one of the reasons I'm such a huge fan of many retirements. Take a month off, take six months, take a year, because you're going to start really creatively thinking about life. And Oftentimes when people's focus questions, like it comes back and it's all like naps, that's burnout. When it comes back and you don't really want to do anything, it looks like I'm going to sleep in and I'm going to drink some coffee and I'm going to watch some TV and read a book and go to bed early. That's burnout. Like that's not how we were created to live. And, And people have to really honestly find ways to combat that. That's a really great point. I mean, I've struggled with burnout a number of times in my life and I've written about it, something I'm kind of naturally wired for. And I found that you really, it took me like six months to actually unpack and recover for that. I know you've taken a mini retirement. You've written a lot about Mm -hmm. it. Can you talk a little bit about what is a mini retirement and how can someone set themselves up perhaps to use a mini retirement or, or an extended period of time to actually figure out what they want to do with their life? Yeah, a mini retirement is any time that we step away from the nine to five to focus on something that really matters to us. And it's it's so much easier than most people think, probably. It can be as short as a month. I mean, a month can do amazing things for people. If you use this really strategically, I had a friend who went to deep as dark as Peru, like Paddington Bear for a month. She had never left the country and she just went and lived like in the rainforest for a month, which was incredible. I mean, those kinds of experiences can really rejuvenate you and recharge you. I know we're both kind of fans of Whidbey Island out in Washington. Spending a month at Whidbey Island and writing every day and exercising every day, meditating every day, like reading every day, that could be amazing for a person. So it can be as little as a month. You don't necessarily have to quit your job and it doesn't take that much money. One of the things I teach is how to negotiate a month off. And I think I actually have a guest post on your site. So look at Grant's site and it's there. How did you negotiate a month off from your employer? And oftentimes it's, it's simpler than people think. But six months, a year... Oftentimes people end up getting their old job back or they find new, better jobs, or it gives them kind of the launch pad to become entrepreneurs, to try something out, to start freelancing. Yeah, you make a great point in that post about 
you know, if you're valuable to your current employer and they want to keep you, they're likely going to be willing to give you some extended time off. This is the tough thing because we we try to take time off, but work is always on our mind. Even when we're on vacation, even when we're trying to check out, you know, this is one of those things I always hated kind of about the weekends is that two days is just obviously now looking back on it, two days is just insanely too short just to actually check in with yourself, check in with your family, your partner. Are there exercises? Is is it meditation? Is it sitting in a hammock and doing something you love? Is it getting out in nature? You know, what are some of those key things that even if someone doesn't have a little bit of time that, that they can use to, to really disconnect and get some perspective? I think it it's whatever works for that person. I tend to work with people who are becoming who are already very successful and they want to become more successful, but maybe in, by a different definition. And I really work with people on building a good regulating toolbox. I've adopted four kids from from foster care and I grew up with a lot of adverse childhood experiences. And one of the things I took from those is that learning how to regulate is so important. And they, in kind of trauma-informed therapy, they talk a lot about dysregulation. And we can dysregulate up or down. And dysregulating up looks like people get anxious, they get angry, they raise their voice, they have all of those kinds of emotions when things dysregulate them, or we dysregulate down. And that looks like people withdraw, they they kind of avoid. And you'll see this in every time someone has a fight with their spouse, conflict at work, they get told no, like so many things in life dysregulate us, but we really need an emotional toolbox that works for us. And for some people, that's meditation. For me, I love, I live in Montana. I'm actually like staring at the mountains right now. I love being out in nature. It's one of the tools in my toolbox. I go and work out. I read. I listen to music. You need to have about 10 or 20 things that work for you. Box breathing is really popular. And then I try to, so I try to make sure people have enough tools because just like trauma and difficult situations can dysregulate us, success and growth dysregulate us almost just as much. It can be really scary to to try new things and to try bigger things. So learning what your toolbox is, and just like with tools, it's important to use them frequently and to keep them in good shape. Because if Let's say going for a run is one of the tools that really works for you, but you haven't run in a year. Like you cannot pull that rusty old tool out of your toolbox when you're having a bad day. Like that is not the right day to keep that tool sharp. Now, that's a great point. And you bring up something that I'd love to dive deeper into is, you know, how do you define success for yourself? Can you talk a little bit about in your experience working with others? How are people defining success and how do you see that? impacting their lives? Yeah, I think success is like those three focus questions I use when we look at the substance of those focus questions. And then I do an exercise where we take kind of those big goals and we figure out what the deep motivations are. And we figure out what their what their superpowers are, which I de- define as things they have a deep knowledge about, things that are in their natural skill set, things they're really passionate about, and things that create flow. And when you build a life that pings all of those deep motivations, that utilizes those superpowers, essentially building a life that's true to yourself, that feels tremendously successful. Now, other people (laughs) might be confused. We always have to deal with other people's confusion. They might say, well, that's not successful by my definition. And that's fine. It doesn't have to be successful by everyone's definition. But once we live a life that just, it pings those deep motivations, it's so true to how we feel like we're made, to what we feel like our calling is, what our gift is. It's just so, not just happiness, but there's a deep meaning of fulfillment in that. And I think that's a life of success. That's a great point. For me, success turned out to be a lot more about peace than it did about money. Yeah. It took me a long, long time to figure that out. When I'm chatting with you, I just keep thinking about, I think a lot of people are like two or three degrees away from a life that they could really love or that they would really love. I think we live in an all or nothing world 
yeah. where there's this idea that to change your life, it has to be this radical, massive thing. Maybe you have to quit your job. Maybe you have to move to another country. Maybe you have to do, you know, you think you have to do all these dramatic things to have a huge shift in your life. But I'm starting to believe that there's maybe only two or three things that you mm-hmm. need to do, like slight pivots that kind of yeah. like, kind of like a ship, you know, like imagine a ship in the ocean. And if you just change the degree two or three degrees in a year, it's like hundreds and hundreds of miles from where it would have been. What do you think are those two or three kind of pivots that most people can make? I actually have a, a post on my site about 20% better. You know, what if you woke up tomorrow morning and one thing in your life was just 20% better? Like, what would that thing be that that you would just be so happy if just that one thing could be 20% better? And sometimes that that is one of our deep motivations, or sometimes that's just something we've been neglecting for so long. It might be our relationship with our kids or our spouse or dealing with a conflict at work or our health. But if that one thing could be 20% better, it makes our life feel like 50% better. And figuring out what that is for for each person, because we can usually make one thing 20% better. In your experience working with others, you know, I'm really interested just because you've been helping other people through these transitions Mm -hmm. as well. What's that 20%? I know it's different for everyone, but what tends to be that 20%? Is it money? Is it health? Is it stress? Is it relationships? Is it all of the above? I mean, what's, what's kind of that typical thing that most people need to shift? I would say the common, when we get down to those deep motivations, some really common elements are people's health. They want to feel, not just that they want to like look amazing in a bathing suit, like that never ends up being someone's deep motivation, but they want to feel strong and capable to live life to the fullest. They typically want to have meaningful, important work where they feel like, and and this is such a confusing thing in our society because people assume if you have deep, meaningful work, that's 12 hours a day. People I work with are definitely like lifestyle entrepreneurs. I think that we can win as entrepreneurs by creating the biggest business. We can win by creating the most profitable business, or we can win by creating a lifestyle business. And the people I work, it's definitely lifestyle. If they could do, usually it runs between three to six hours of something that creates a lot of flow, that they know they're making a contribution, that utilizes their skill set. And often it comes down to, I have this unique gift And if I can use this, do this thing that I feel like I'm uniquely gifted to do, it just creates so much satisfaction and joy. And rest is a big one. I think, I think rest comes in because our life is so frantic and it's so crazy and there's so many demands on our time and our attention and it boils down to emotional energy almost. You know, when people are so maxed out and they're so tired, we don't have time to, to listen and to connect and to care and to have empathy because we're just overwhelmed with our own stuff. That's a good point. I mean, what, what, gosh, you know, I just keep thinking about how, you know, we live in this three, this 24, seven, 365 world and we're going faster and more of is expected of us and we're expecting more of ourselves and it's impossible or really difficult to get time to disconnect often because we either rely on our jobs for money or we need, we don't have enough money to kind of take that break. This seems easier to do for someone who's maybe 24 years old and doesn't have a family yet. And they can do the backpacking trip through Europe or go live in a national park for three months and and do that type of soul searching for lack of a better phrase. What about the person who has two kids and a mortgage and a car payment and soccer practice and too many things to do in addition to their full-time job. How can that person disconnect or maybe come to the realization that there needs to be a bigger change in their life? Yeah, I have so much empathy for that spot. Unlike some people in the in the fire community, you know, me and my husband, we never we never earned even combined, we never earned six figures. I think we topped out one year. It was like 70,000 with, if you included all the benefits. So I was working at like Starbucks. I was, he was in the army. I was, 
21 when we decided to adopt our first child. So we had our our first kid at home by the time I was 22 and lived in a little apartment. So it wasn't like... It wasn't like we started this journey as trust fund kids who could just fully actualize all day long. We were just busting our butts to to create a little bit of financial freedom. But the thing that helped us is that from the day we got married, I was at the ripe old age of 19 years old, we kept those dreams. We kept that vision front and center. And honestly, I had no idea how we would do any of it. Like I really wanted to travel the world. I had such a heart for adopting kids. I wanted to be able to pay cash for a house. And this was like insane. That first year we had $55,000 of debt. And I think we made $12,000 that first year. I mean, it was not like a fantastic start to this financial independence story, but making sure you take time to dream together, to to imagine what life could be like together. And even if that's just a date night, if that's waking up early before the kids get up and making a cup of coffee, we used to do um, kind of like dream dates together. And one of the posts on my site, which really resonates with people, is at the end of each year, actually, we're kind of, I'm already starting to, to contemplate it. We come up with a quit list. And a quit list is everything that we're going to give up to make space for something great that we want to see happen the next year, what we want our life to look like. Oftentimes it's easy to get rid of like the low value things or the no value things, but on the quit list, I get rid of good things because oftentimes we have to get rid of the good to make space for the great. And I think about it like, like playing poker and I have all my chips and I'm pushing those chips to the middle of the table and each one represents a good thing I'm giving up because I'm going to double down and I'm going to go all in on our biggest dreams. Wow. I'm like literally tearing up over here. I've never thought about that idea of the quit list, getting rid of things that maybe you even enjoy or... Yeah that are creating some good in your life to make room for those larger, perhaps more meaningful, more transformative things in our life. I I, I think that that's a really great idea first. And I think a lot of people settle into ease and convenience. I think, you know, we work so hard that we feel we've earned the right to check out or we settle for kind of good enough when Mm -hmm. maybe we, there's some deep longing in us that maybe it's kind of coming to the surface now. Maybe it'll come to the surface in a couple of years, but just because something is even kind of good today, it could be blocking something great. And I, I love that idea of the quit list. Can you give an example of something that you've quit, that you liked, and what that's opened up for you? Oh, man. So thinking back to your example of this family, two incomes, kids, mortgage, because we were kind of in, in that circle. We did pay cash for our house eventually, so we didn't have a mortgage, but we have five kiddos at home right now. And so we took a hard look at our possessions we actually got rid of about half of our possessions, partly because, and here's what that opened up. We got rid of almost all the kids' toys. We keep the toys they have left on a shelf downstairs. And it's one of the most popular posts on my site about minimalism with kids is we let our kids play with three toys at a time. And for all of the mamas, all of the parents out there that fight with your kids over cleaning up the room, this opened up so much time and emotional energy and just joy in our house because I don't pick up toys. I don't pick them up and I don't have to fight with my kids about them picking them up. We got rid of all the sports activities because we really wanted to travel with our kids and it was you know, it's money and time, kids sports. And I said, we could do this or we could do that, but we can't do both. So this last year we did a 10 week road trip through 10 national parks with all five of our kids in a pop-up camper. You know, we, we went through, we actually, we got rid of some relationships. There are some relationships that just aren't really helping either person, but we hold on to them because it dysregulates us to have that conversation or to change something. So we went through our, our our budget, our schedule, our possessions, and anything that wasn't like 
the best. Sometimes we we got rid of it altogether, and sometimes we said not this year. You know, this isn't going to be the year for that. We got rid of our ducks, and I am like obsessed with ducks. I love them so much. I don't know why they're just the cutest animals in the world to me. And we had eight ducks, and we got rid of our ducks because we wanted to travel and we wanted to do other things. And ducks actually don't travel very well. Wow. So cleaning out even relationships. Are your husband and you most often on the same page or are there things that one of you wants to get rid of that the other doesn't? So for for our possessions, we we followed uh, two rules. First, we w- we went through and we said we have to we have to touch every item. Like if we have too many physical possessions in our home that we can't like just touch it, then it's just too many. But we said it can't be lazy. Like I can't I can't have any lazy stuff in my house. It has to be hardworking stuff. So if I'm using it every day, totally hardworking. If I'm using it every week. That's pretty hardworking. If I use it twice a year, that's really lazy. And lazy stuff just needs to go live someplace else where it can work hard. And then the other rule we had was if I could find this item at a yard sale for $5, then it's okay to get rid of it. Like if if it's a little bit lazy and I could replace it used for $5, like it doesn't deserve a spot in my home. And those two rules, I think some people who perhaps are less frugal could go with like $20 used, but we, it was our first round. So we went with $5 used, Um, but it helped us get rid of a lot of things that we were kind of on the fence about, like a cooler. Like, do we need a cooler? When was the last time we used a cooler? You know, we could probably find a new one like at a yard sale for five bucks. So we were able to get rid of stuff like that. You talked about how we look at challenges and the challenges in our life really has a profound impact on constructing a meaningful life and how we kind of move forward in our life. Can you talk a little bit about how someone can identify those challenges, perhaps those things that they don't like that they should be mm-hmm. uh, quitting? Challenges are such they're such a tricky thing, and it's not something that I think most people are good at effectively solving. I heard an Einstein quote once that he said if if he was presented with a problem, he would spend 55 minutes of the hour, and he was only given an hour, he would spend 55 minutes considering the problem and then five minutes solving it. But the reality is for most of us, honestly looking at a problem makes us feel a little dysregulated, makes us feel uncomfortable or anxious or vulnerable. So like a hot potato, we throw it and we just solve it. <laughs> like if you sit in a meeting, we're like, here's a challenge. How how many minutes do we sit around and consider what the challenge is? Do we fully dig into the challenge before everyone's like, okay, solutions, solutions, like let's fix it. Um, sometimes we're fixing things that aren't the real challenge. They're just that top level of the challenge. So one of the things I do in my mentoring is we take all these all this great content from our focus questions, all of these big goals, and I say, okay, well, what's the challenge to that? And, you know, inevitably, the first thing that comes to people's mind is the most reasonable or the most rational, but it's never the real challenge. And it takes some time to sit with the challenge and to kind of peel back the layers to figure out what's actually going on. Because if we don't, if we never address it, what I see happen is it'll slow people down. They'll think, gosh, I'm putting so much effort. Like, why is this this just taking so long? But oftentimes our goal, the thing that really we really care about, I think about it like a bridge. And it's on the other side of this bridge, but we have to walk through that challenge. We have to address it head on. So sometimes it'll stop people. And the most painful for me to watch is sometimes it will detour people miles in the wrong direction. And those are the people you see that like, I'm doing so much and I'm hustling and I'm trying and I'm, I'm I'm doing all these things and I'm just not getting any closer. And it's because they're detouring. They're running miles down this ravine instead of actually going through the challenge. But once we... Once we fully understand what it is, oftentimes the challenge we can self-correct. It's amazing. I love this part when I work with people, you know, they, they pull up this deep challenge and it's like, it's always really deep personal stuff. It's stuff that like has, 
usually a little bit of an emotional tenor to it. But once they say it out loud, they realize that's not even true anymore. Like that's an old story I've been telling myself or that's, that's something that I worried about as a kid, but it's not even applicable to my life. Or it's some kind of free-floating anxiety that was floating there, but but it has no basis in reality. And so they're able to self-correct. Sometimes we need a new perspective. Or sometimes once we actually know what the real problem is, we can strategize that. We can create a plan to fully address that challenge. Yeah, I was chatting with someone recently and they mentioned to me, you know, it's often those things that hurt in your life, the ones that you ignore that you should be paying attention to because the reason that they hurt is because they mean something to you. And so those are the sites of exploration as opposed to the things that you should, and probably the sites for growth and not the things that you should hide in the closet. And I love how you phrase that. It kind of boils down to that, that dysregulation. Whenever people come up to something that makes them feel hesitant or uncomfortable or a little bit fearful Oftentimes, our natural tendency is to spin on our heels and go the opposite direction, like as quick as possible, away from that thing that makes us feel uncomfortable. And and sometimes it's just, it's a difficult conversation with our spouse. It's bills that we don't know how to pay. It's we want to create something or build something, but then we feel hesitant and we just turn around and walk away. And one of the things I encourage people to practice is just sit there for a minute sit in that uncomfortable spot and ask, so what about this makes me feel uncomfortable? Or why do I feel hesitant? Or where is this fear coming from? And and you don't have to live in that space, but if you can sit there for two or three minutes and ask some good questions, you'll actually know what's causing you hesitation. And then we can fix that thing. So what other things do you see that hold most people back in in your coaching business? We've talked about kind of they're not looking at the challenges. Perhaps they just they're they're suffering from burnout so they can't mm-hmm. get space with which to go deep and find those passions. Is there anything else any common themes that you see in in the people that you work with? I think one of the things that plagues almost everyone is that there's a a very linear way things have to be done. Kind of a lack of, of creative thinking, a lack of examining multiple options. I was reading in I was Essentialism, he was talking about how our choices can never be taken away, but we can forget. We can forget that we have a choice. And this is an exercise I have to work with with a lot of people is they think, well, no, this is the only way that that I can do it, or this is the only option, or I'm stuck. I grew up below the poverty line. And that is such a prevalent fear and concern. Like it's such a prevalent mindset that this is the only option and this is what I have to do. And I don't have any choices and I just need to keep my head down. I need to push through because, because I don't have any other choices. All of my choices have been taken from me. And the reality is you might not have a better choice, but there are other choices. And being able to step back and say, what are eight different ways I could solve this problem? Even if some of them are horrible, even if some of them don't even make sense. I love that quote from Alice in Wonderland where the queen says, you know, sometimes I believe six impossible things before breakfast. And I actually have that like on a magnet on my fridge because it's so important to allow ourselves to fully look at all of the options, the bad options, the good options, the crazy options, because in doing that, you might find a better option. Do you think, because you live in such a beautiful place, you're around nature, the cost of living, I believe in Montana is relatively reasonable. How has that impacted your own financial as well as personal journey? And I'm asking that because so many people, you know, we're all flocking to cities. I read some statistic, it was just like 70 some percent of people are going to live in a city by the year 2050. And when we live in cities, we disconnect from nature. We often are forced to rely on ourselves because maybe we're far from the community we grew up in and far from our families. And there's this kind of 
rugged individualism that happens in cities that I think puts a lot of pressure on us because we can't or it's harder to rely on those around us to build us up and support us. And so we feel like we have to do everything ourselves. And there's there's a fantasy, uh, at least for me. I mean, I was just in upstate New York this past weekend and just the, the difference between there and New York City is just so huge. I feel much calmer, much happier. Not that I dislike New York City. It's just I can feel almost unconsciously my, 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 my body and my mind relax when I'm outside of the city. What would you recommend to the person who lives in a city? How, how can they get some of those amazing benefits of living in a place, both from a cost perspective and a well-being perspective like Montana? <laughs> Very different. That is one of maybe the common misconceptions about where I live in Montana is that it's really affordable. Unfortunately, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's so delightful. Everything, I think HGTV is building their dream home, like just down the road from us this year. Like it's, it's very much a destination and vacation place. So it is not tremendously affordable, unfortunately, but you know, more affordable than New York City. Um, You can get something nice for a million dollars, but you cannot find anything for $100,000. But yeah, I think the regulation piece comes back to what works for that person. Like know your toolbox, practice your toolbox, build it up. One of the things I encourage people to do is to combine tools. So I know my tools. I, I love eating ice cream. My feelings when I eat them oftentimes taste like ice cream. I love being outside. I love going for walks and I love spending time with friends and having really good conversations. So this summer I said, I'm going to do all five at the same time. I'm not a big fan of multitasking, but I'm definitely a big fan of doing one thing that hits five different goals. So I set a goal this summer to eat 50 scoops of ice cream. And the rule was I had to meet a friend and go outside and go for a walk downtown and have a great conversation with this friend. And and that combining all five of those tools together was was really helpful. And finding, I think finding something that works for you. Like I'm a strong, I'm a strong introvert. I'm a high empathy person. And the mountains have always worked. Like I grew up in the middle of the state of Montana. Like I said, I had a lot of adverse childhood experiences. And so I was kind of a high anxiety kid, but my grandpa had a little cabin in, in Glacier National Park, which is, I live right outside of Glacier. So I would go up there in the summer and I would just, I would just be outside 12 hours a day and I would walk down by the river and I would hike into the park and I would bike down to Apgar and Lake McDonald. And I just felt the most like myself. I felt my best and everyone needs to find the thing that makes them feel their best. Whether it's a good conversation with a friend or a yoga class or journaling or whatever that thing is so that you can recharge, you can regulate yourself so you can bring your best and your biggest and your most authentic self to the world. Have you ever read Forest Bathing? I haven't. Oh, gosh. So there's this whole science in Japan. I'm going to botch the pronunciation, but it's called Shinrin-yoku, which is kind of the science of of forest bathing. And they have a a national organization that helps people decompress and de-stress through forest bathing, which is the simple idea of, you know, spending time in nature intentionally. And so it's something that's really simple, but like a lot of the things that the Japanese latch on to, there, there's such a beautiful simplicity to it. And, you know, it goes back centuries. I purposefully, I live by Riverside Park in New York City. It's like one of the largest parks. And I purposefully did that so I could forest bathe. And I've yeah. been, one of the things I've been doing a couple of days a week when it's not raining is I just like go and lay under the trees. And I think that of anything that I'm doing in my life, at least right now, is what's helping me the most. So to all those out there who feel stuck, forest bathing is a legit thing. And you get it to the ex- <laughs> you get it to the extreme out there. I've been to Glacier and it's just like A, when when I was in Montana, I felt very mu- very small in the universe, which yeah. in and of itself allowed me, I think, to let go of some of those sort of expectations in my life and just kind of surrender to the rhythm of it. Mm-hmm. So what, as, as someone who's kind of a, a high achiever, what are some other t- tools in your toolbox? Like, how do you, 
self-regulate and kind of refresh because I think this is so important even on the money side because oftentimes we spend a lot of money to try to regulate even though it's not effective like ah, I'm feeling miserable and stressed like I'll buy a new car or I'll buy a different house um, or I'll go out to eat a lot even though those things aren't actually effective tools they're they're easy tools yeah I'm actually pretty bad at it um, so <laughs> just being honest I think I've never been particularly great with routines. I am good at flowing with my own rhythm. And I think those are kind of two different things. You know, I love this uh, Alan Watts quote. It's like, life is meant to be played. Like almost, you know, like music, life's meant to be played. And for me, the rhythm of each day is often very different. And I've found that trying to wake up every day and do the same routine For me, it's like trying to jam on a beat that I don't want to jam to. It's just like doesn't feel right. And I know it works for some people. I know it's like, oh, here's the 10 things that you need to do in the morning to crush your day. And, you know, there's so much of that out there. I always found that really kind of stressful. And for me, what's worked really well is first biggest benefit to me, hands down of FI, is just being able to wake up naturally. I think of all the things in my life that simply has has just had a massive impact because when you wake up naturally, the level of calm that I kind of feel in the morning is something that I've kind of never had before. And I just get a sense for, you know, I kind of check in with myself, like what's my rhythm today? How am I feeling? Of course, you're gonna have a busy day and you're gonna have to get a lot of things done. Some days I wake up and I'm like, I'm just gonna crush it today. I'm feeling good. I'm on that Mm -hmm. rhythm. Everything's aligned. I'm going to get it all done. Other mornings I wake up and I'm just like, no, today is not the day. And I think that giving yourself permission, very obviously hard to do if you've got a, a nine to five, but even if you have a nine to five, giving yourself some permission, hey, you know, I'm going to take a sick morning and just rest or I'm going to take it easy today at work. Tougher to do, but our, our minds, I don't think our minds or our bodies are meant to not only go hard every day, but I do really find that for me, it's not even like I have two or three good hours a day. It's like I have good days and bad days. And on those good days, it's like I can go really purposefully for like 14 hours. And then on those bad days, I just have to be like, all right, I'm throwing in the towel or even not a bad day. Like I'm throwing in the towel this morning and I'm going to see how I feel this afternoon. And that's one of the great things I think in custom build your life is building a life that works for you, building something that you want to have. You know, I think kind of that limited thinking, some people are like, well, you can't have a job where you can just opt out one day and then work really hard another day. It might take a while to build that job, but they're out there. You can build a job that that earns income and it's really meaningful and it gives you your highest point of contribution and has flexible hours. I always remind people, like, whatever the weirdest, craziest job you can think of, I almost guarantee that there is another human being right now on this earth doing that as their job. Absolutely. And the thing is, like we were talking about, it's not an all or nothing thing. You don't have to be like, I'm going to quit everything in my life and go do this thing instead. It can be like, that's why side hustling is so beautiful. It's like, I'm going to test this out. I'm going to see how it makes me feel. I'm going to see what I learn. It's almost like crafting a life as opposed to even designing it. Because I think with crafting something, it's kind of like, it's going to take time. It's going to be messy. But as long as longitudinally, you're kind of moving in the right direction, you can get a lot of those benefits as you move in that direction. It's just kind of like saving money. You can get a lot of the freedom of FI Mm -hmm. as you move in that direction. You don't have to kind of go all in. And then you can surprise yourself. That's the biggest thing Mm -hmm. that I learned is like, you learn something about yourself where you're like, oh, and then it actually makes it a little bit easier to go in the direction that you want to go to. Inertia, inertia is just a really, really, really powerful thing. It's like, you just got to like, just slightly move in a different direction. And that's really, really what it takes. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of, I call it test and scale where we do a little test and I define a test as something you can do in one to four hours. You do a little test 
um, you get some feedback, you maybe have a good conversation, you learn something about yourself, you learn something about the industry, and then you apply that information, you pivot, and you do another little test. Because a lot of the times people don't do big things is, you know, we have those hesitations, we have those challenges, and we're a little bit scared. And so they don't, they either, they either jump into the deep end And I almost think that that can be a form of laziness. Like I wasn't willing to test and scale this for two years. I only want it if I can have it all right now. But I'm not going to like build a thing on a side for two years. Like it's not worth two years of my life. And I think that's almost kind of a form of laziness. But if you say this thing matters and I'm going to test it and I'm going to scale it and I'm going to keep going and absorb that information, learn from it, pivot a little bit. I really believe that confidence and clarity come in doing. We can't just sit on our couch and think about it. We gain the confidence and we gain the clarity as we take steps in that direction. Hey, Jillian, this has just been a real pleasure having you on the podcast. I really enjoyed the conversation. I love everything that you're doing for the community just focusing on that other side of the coin and leading with life as opposed to leading with the money. And I really appreciate you taking the time to be on the podcast. Can you tell everyone where they can find you and what you're up to now? Yeah, the easiest way to find me is on Montana Money Adventures. And the best way to keep in touch with me is through my email list. I have a ton of free resources for my email subscribers. So you'll get all the focus questions and tons of worksheets to get started to have these great conversations. I even have like little conversation sheets that you can print off and like take on a date, go take them on a walk or on a long drive and just start dreaming again. Start thinking about what you want this life to look like. Hey, Jillian, thank you and enjoy your day. And I'm really excited to be on this journey with you. Thank you so much, Grant. Thanks for listening to the Financial Freedom Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review and subscribe. To learn more, get show notes, and dive deeper, visit financialfreedombook.com. Thank you.